Hi, this is Paul. Some days I wake up and I think, I want well, to know what I would make a video about. And I start doing a PowerPoint and then I get busy with all sorts of things and the video sort of wanders around, but here we are. Religion and morality. How these two things relate. I started reading um, George Yancey's book, One Faith No Longer, The Transformation of Christianity into Red and Blue America. I was became aware of this book after I watched this video, and I'm still tempted to do a commentary on it between Sean McDowell and George Yancey. I thought it was a, a, a good conversation. I wished it had gone deeper, and that's often the kind of video that either the video I think deserves explanation or the video lacks a degree of depth that I think maybe I can make some contributions to, but I'm still unsure whether I'll take the time to actually go through the whole thing because there's a bunch of things that I, I want to talk about. It asks whether conservative Christianity and progressive Christianity diverge to the point that they should be categorized as different religions. Now, there's a lot going on there, um, not the least of which is that, in my opinion, the span between conservative Christianity and progressive Christianity very much is a spectrum, and it isn't really sort of two distinct groups. What his analysis tries to do is sort of clarify the categories, and then you have the other difficult thing of getting into the question of how you would ascertain whether or not two things are separate religions. Uh, many religions share some common elements. Other religions share different elements. Religions are massive things that are enormously complex. And so the analysis is challenging, but I was impressed by what I heard in the video, and so far I've been very impressed by what I find in the book. There's a lot of data in the book and he's a there's a ton of footnotes there's a ton of other work cited so it's a significant it's a significant piece of work and so i i plan to enjoy continuing to read it and you'll probably see more and more things in the videos coming as i go through the book now there's a long history of these questions um the modernist fundamentalist controversy at the end of the 19th beginning of the 20th century was clearly a part of this and J. Gresham Macon's uh, Christianity and Liberalism is a classic in terms of conservative reformed Christianity lays down a bunch of things H. Richard Niebuhr however really has the distinction of sort of having the best quip about the divergence in that era a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. I didn't have that memorized, so I had to look it up. And as I read it, I thought, it's remarkable to me how dated this sounds in the public sphere. When you watch movies, Ben-Hur, The Robe, movies from the 1950s, the, the, the height, the peak of the mainline movement um, wouldn't, wouldn't be embarrassed at all to talk about Christ in these ways. Yet today, the conversation, and anyone out in the public sphere who used words this particular, you know, Joe Biden is a church-going Roman Catholic. Go ahead, let the comments run on that statement. But Joe Biden observes the secular modernist, I don't talk about my faith in public very much. And in that way, he and Jordan Peterson sort of have something in common, that the particularities and the um, the particularities of your faith are a private thing and, well, America is supposed to have a separation between church and state, and its public officials ought to do that. Now, there's a ton of questions that we've been looking at about how church and state really do relate. And in my three-hour-plus-long video about marriage equality, meaning death to Protestant churches, I talked about the fact that in many ways, Charles Taylor's two-speed religion in Protestantism uh, 
sort of has the church as the fast speed, sort of taking the place of the monastery, and the state or the secular realm as the slow speed, which would sort of be Christendom or you know, drowsy nominal Catholics in medieval Europe, something to this, something to this degree. Now, I haven't really yet done any serious commentary on the rise and fall of Mars Hill. That's still coming out. Now they've reduced their output to one every other week. I guess all of those production values really slow you down. If you don't have any production values, you can be fast like me. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. One of the things that I often think about when I listen to this is the condemnation of Mark Driscoll and how, in some ways, unusual this is for the evangelical world. We're very used to hearing about Christian ministers who have the, the term of art is moral failure, and that almost always means usually an affair. Um, that Mark, there's no charge that Mark Driscoll had an affair. I mean, he seriously loves his wife, and part of what made people uncomfortable was the explicit nature that he would use to describe how he loved his wife, or as his wife loved him. Um, no charge of sexual misconduct for him. Mark Driscoll's sins in this are quite interesting, and and you know this isn't sort of a a progressive conservative thing because he was, you know, his own church was attempting to discipline him basically when he quit and ran away or God called him to a new place, depending on how you want, which frame you want to see it through. You know, his, the, the charges against him were for being an authoritarian, for being dictatorial and abusive. But now it isn't that there's no charges of sexual abuse or molestation or anything like that. It's emotionally abusive. He was mean. He was manipulative. He was authoritative and dictatorial. Those were really the things that he's charged with. And even the very conservative church that he planted and grew thought these things to be out of step with the character of their leader. And, and that's not an insignificant thing. Now, the broader culture, and, and again, a lot of this, part, part of what bleeds through this podcast is, again, we've talked about it in previous, previous comments on it, the emergent movement split sort of into the young, restless, and reformed, and what we call now the progressive evangelicals. And in many ways, Rob Bell is part of the progressive evangelicals, and Mark Driscoll was part of the young, restless, and reformed. And they've both continued to evolve since then. The broader of culture tends to focus on um, the fight over women in church leadership, condemnation and, um, towards LGBTQ. Uh, if you grow a large church, make sure it's the right kind of church for a lot of people. And that usually mirrors their ideas of what churches should be, what they should do, and what messages that they send. Now, I'm continuing to read James Wellman's High on God and finding that, too, to be an absolutely fascinating book, especially in conjunction with um, George Yancey's book. Because basically, when we look at how progressive Christianity and conservative Christianity continue to diverge, and again, in some ways, the emergent movement was sort of the tip of the spear for both of these a lot of the questions are going to revolve around differing moral visions of the good life. Now, what's very interesting is, and I agree with George Yancey towards the end of this conversation he has with Sean McDonald, McDowell, the question is, will they're both sort of claiming the name Christian, will one no longer be associated with it? And, and Yancey basically says yes. And to absolutely nobody's surprise, it will be the progressives. And, and for that reason, this does seem to be in continuity with the early 20th century's questions about Christianity and liberalism and A. Richard Niebuhr's comments. 
So I want to do a little bit of reading in Wellman's book because, again, I'm, I'm impressed by the book. Again, the language is overly academic in many respects. And that's a shame because this the book has a title and a topic that I think could have a lot of popular appeal. But the book makes a, a ton of points that I think could find resonance both with people who tend to lean towards conservative Christianity and those who come at the book from a secular perspective. Part of what I've been really impressed by this book for is its fairness. Now, now chapter six here, I think, is a very helpful one. It's one of my favorite chapters in the book so far. How do congregational studies illumine the trends in the American religious belief over the past hundred years? The senior author's book, The Gold Coast and the Ghetto, Christ and Culture and Mainline Protestantism, changed the moment, traced the momentous changes at the 20th century through the lens of Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago. Fourth Church, as insiders usually call it, today serves more than 5,000 adults in a, congregational, in a congregation generally considered liberal Protestant. According to the data, liberal Protestant megachurches are rare. Thus, this is an counter example of liberal Protestant decline and an increasing and an interesting church to think about in a book on evangelical megachurches. Thanks to Fourth Presbyterian's voluminous archives, the senior author excavated the complex history of the city of Chicago from the perspective of the leading liberal mainline Protestant church. I argue that there was a specific transformative moments in Fourth Presbyterian's history that illumined the wider changes in American religion. We pick up the story of Fourth Presbyterian Church at a time when it was in the mainstream of early 20th century evangelical mainline Protestantism. And again, Reading this book is something that could be done with profit with George Marsden's Fundamentalism in American Culture. It's also helpful to continue to remember what, in American historical terms, is, are called the Progressive Era. This was the era in which child labor laws came into um, force, the rise of unionization, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's trust busting, um, the, wise of, the rise of women's suffrage, you know, this is right on the heels of abolitionism, but the um, one of the elements of this that is often sort of dismissed and put away, of course, is the temperance movement. And one thing that's vital to remember about the temperance movement is that this movement was so pervasive, widespread, and it should be remembered religious that it changed. They they both it both they both succeeded in getting a constitutional amendment for prohibition put in. And anyone who knows anything about American politics knows it is not easy to amend the Constitution of the United States. The founders made it intentionally difficult. That's how powerful the temperance movement was. And equally amazing is just how quickly it got taken off the books. John Timothy Stone, its pastor from 1908 to 1928, that's just at the tail end of the progressive era. Really, the, the peak of the progressive era is Woodrow Wilson and his, um, his desire to, if you think there's going to be you know, a great reset after the pandemic, Woodrow Wilson tried to reset the world at the end of the First World War. A very ambitious project, which in many ways failed. Forged a growing influential congregation, he was an evangelical Presbyterian, a person of repute um, in the wider church, a moderate of the denomination in 1913-1914, and a friend of Woodrow Wilson, and a strongly evangelical Christian who started an underground young men's ministry with the ambitious goal of evangelizing young businessmen in the near north side of downtown Chicago. He built a large ministry, two to 3,000 attendants in 1910s. Along with strong missional enterprise, churchgoers gave more than $500,000 a year to overseas 
mission purposes alone. Elite young Protestants sacrificed their privilege to go overseas in mission to China. In fact, one of the Chicago's fairest sons, a young man from an elite family and a Yale graduate, died in China within two months of his overseas mission. His obituary made front page news in the Chicago newspaper. This is a vision from a very different world from ours today. And I think it's extremely important to get a sense of just how central Christianity was in the American ma imagination to this point. Really, modernity is about to reach its zenith really right at the point of World War I where it starts to descend. But, but notice the deep ties between Christianity and modernity and the kind of faith that they were looking for that, that spawned these um, these world evangelistic missions was in fact a very much a conversionist faith. But still at that point, there was a sense that many of these groups were post-millennial, which means that they imagined in a very progressive way the world was going to continue to improve and improve and improve right on into the eschaton. Of course, all of this would sort of start to come apart in the battlefields of the First World War. And all of Woodrow Wilson's attempt to sort of put the world back together really wouldn't come to pass when, of course, after you had the Roaring Twenties, after the war, you had Prohibition, you had the Great Depression. In Europe, of course, you had the, the rise of Nazism and Communism, and that, of course, would set the stage for the Second World War and what would come after that. One of Stone's elders, Henry Crowell, the chair of Quaker Oats, not only supported global missions, but also pushed his company into international markets, um, presaging American influence overseas, as well as accelerating the American understanding of the globe, which, as David Hollander has argued, had profound reciprocal effects on American culture and politics. After the war and in reaction to the fundamentalist, modernist, Protestant controversies, Crowell broke with Fourth Presbyterian and became a leader and central donor and funder of the Moody Bible Institute, also in Chicago. Crowell, a strident biblicist, and this will be, again, part of the line that will develop between modernism and fundamentalism, hence Mesham's book, Christianity and Liberalism, he left his substantial wealth to Moody Bible Institute with the proviso that the institute would maintain an evangelical and conservative set of doctrines in perpetuity. The modernist fundamentalist controversy in the mainline denomination and in the U.S. Presbyterian Church forced a split between liberals and moderates on one hand and theological conservatives on the other. The overall controversy was a long time coming. In fact, it had been building for a number of decades. Again, read Marsden's Fundamentalism in American Culture. It forced the Presbyterians to take sides on the issue of core doctrines. The conservatives and fundamentalists demanded that the Bible be interpreted as inspired and inerrant. And that word inerrant, again, if you read Marsden's book, is really key and central to the controversy. The inerrant word of God. They upheld the virgin birth of Christ, the belief that Christ's death was necessary for the atonement of sins, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and the historical reality of Jesus' miracles. And again, you can see a lot of this behind H. Richard Niebuhr's quip about liberalism. A presenting issue in much of the debate was the argument over Darwinian theory of evolution. Most liberals either accepted evolution or at least thought it a valid argument. Conservatives and those who, those who would become fundamentalists found the new science abhorrent and a sure way to undercut the authenticity and authority of the Bible. That's part of it. Of course, you can't look at this without the Scopes trial, William Jennings Bryant. Again, many of the fundamentalists, like Bryant, also had in their views ideas of social Darwinism. And those ideas would reign, and you would find them in moderate and liberal Protestant writings in this era a lot. And if you read, if you read liberal and and moderate Protestants in the pre World War II period, many today are a little bit shocked at things that sound racist, 
um, eugenics. There's just a, a lot of social Darwinian ideas that, that, were, that were really uh, quite prevalent. Those, of course, would sort of get backed out of once Hitler would come to power and really double down on these ideas and the West sort of shrunk back from them. Much of what happened in the 20th century Protestantism drew on these sides. Sides were taken and denominations were split between modernists and fundamentalists. Today, not all evangelicals are fundamentalists and not all liberals believe in evolution, but the general split still holds and the two American Christianities have gone their separate ways. And, and in some ways, see, I, I don't think Yancey's book, this is where we sort of talk about a spectrum because many who went liberal early on, you know, departed. And so there continues to be a spectrum between them. Most of the mega churches that we studied are on the conservative side of this theological spectrum, with some exceptions. Generally, liberal Protestants hold, hold, uphold the freedom of individuals to think for themselves on issues, so there are more latitude on doctrine. Now, when we get into Yancey's book, some of these things are changing now, and, and that's significant. And part of where Yancey's book really comes to the fore here is some of the sort of implicit well, we'll get into that when we get into Yancey's book. But while evangelicals may quietly demur on some doctrines, in general, they hold a high view on the authority and inerrancy of Scripture, though few might call themselves fundamentalists. Thus, there is much more fluidity on these issues and doctrines than many think. We learn never to take someone's view on these matters for granted. We found many exceptions to the rule in our megachurch members. The senior author, that's Wellman, wrote the book on Fourth Presbyterian Church covering each of the four long pastorates of the 20th century. John Timothy Stone, an evangelical Christian, served 1910s to 1920s, a time when his church was becoming more moderate theologically. There you're reaching the height of modernity, but there's always sort of a lag and so still very much evangelical. Before the war, Stone had built a church with the kind of certainty and muscularity, it's a very interesting word, that befitted someone entrenched in privilege. Stone's status and the church's finances facilitated his ability to rally Chicago elites to invest in an evangelical mission. And again, securing the this guy from Quaker Oats with very deep pockets, that's part of the picture. As noted in the 1910s, Fourth Presbyterian sent many to serve as missionaries, often to China and India, and ensure this mission was thoroughly embedded in American culture and politics. Stone, and, and this goes into a lot of the, that, that's assumed by modernity in many ways, okay? You don't have the sort of self-conscious ideas about cultural relativism that you're going to find even in evangelical missions today. Stone was known nationally known as one of President, Wood, um, President Wilson's trusted confidants. He supported the First World War generally as a cheerleader and also as a chaplain for the American military bases. He worked tirelessly speaking nearly every night of the week to troops and training. In the post-war period, however, everything changed. The ghastly nature of the war put the lie, put, put the lie to the glory of fighting for the country and undercut the whole notion that its purpose was was to spread faith and democracy. Now, read Jenkins' book on religion in the First World War. It's a great book. Isolation became the theme for this interwar period. Stone's ministry did not fall, fail after the war, but his vision no longer rallied his congregation. You probably see something of a, a crisis of confidence in the old regime. What he brought, this muscularity that he brought to the older vision, waned. By the time he retired from Fourth Presbyterian in 1928, his dreams were much diminished. And when he took up the presidency of McCormick Seminary, his ambitious building plans for it were torpedoed by the economic shock of the Great Depression. More generally, mainline Protestantism declined, and the Depression hampered growth and mission efforts among evangelical churches as well. 
The United States pulled back from its international engagements. The Protestant elite turned away from faith and missions work and faith and missions. Now, there were, if you go back in the history of missions, you find these periods, and these periods do relate to broader trends in society and also broader moral assumptions. Fourth Presbyterian during the heyday of Stone's pastorate, um, that characterized Fourth Presbyterian during the heyday of Stone's pastorate. Furthermore, a second major change in American religion came in the 1960s. For the first half of the 20th century, Fourth Presbyterian attracted the elite of Chicago and influenced wider social movements in the church. But as Reverend Elam Davies took the helm in 1961, this began to change. While Davies' Welsh brogue and talent for oratory drew large crowds to the church, the broad social movements of the 1960s overshadowed both his leadership and the church's willingness to engage American culture. Early in his tenure, even as Davies retired, Fourth Presbyterian's antiquated pew rental system. I have no idea what that was about. He condemned local anti-war protests and largely ignored the civil rights movement. In other words, he's part of the establishment. His engagement with the issues of urban poverty and racialized ghettos of Chicago came late. Fourth Presbyterian did eventually build apartment units for low-income families and created strong tutor programs for residents of the nearby Cabrini-Green public housing development, but Davies failed to preach against the, the building um, failed to preach against the building of public housing that segregated African Americans on the west side of the Dan Ryan Expressway. Chicago's downtown, called The Loop, became a haven for white privilege, surrounded by what came to be known as the Second Ghetto, which moved black Chicagoans out of, out, um, away from the downtown elite. Further, furthermore, by the end of Davies' tenure, Fourth Presbyterian no longer attracted Chicago leaders. Now, if you remember the video that I was talking about, in some ways the main line sort of want to act like they're a vanguard, but really as a vanguard, that ended in the beginning of the 20th century, even though the main lines would continue to be healthy and grow throughout the Cold War period, the evangelicals increasingly, Billy Graham most notably, became sort of the leaders of the visible American church movement. Fourth Presbyterian no longer attracted Chicago leaders, nor had much of a voice in the political issues of the city. There's a major change. You can read Marsden's Twilight of the American Enlightenment. In 1985, Reverend John Buchanan's ministry acknowledged this shift. No longer was there a direct line, as Davies had once bragged, between the pastor and the mayor. Now, it's interesting when you look at, let's say, the rise of black churches, in certain American cities that had significant African-American populations as, let's say, mainline white pastors that, again, no longer had the kind of power they had at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Black pastors would have more power. They had more influence. And a big piece of that was they had more influence over their congregations. And the tradition in America has been if a white pastor tells its church how to vote, the news sort of freaks out. Black pastors have had a lot more leeway in terms of having politicians in church. Part of that is due to the different ways, in, in many ways, especially in the South, churches were the only organizations African Americans could own. And so they sort of had a broader reach than in the north and again this i think gets sort of into charles taylor's one speed two speed if the public secular world is sort of the protestant seconds second speed well you see the weakness of what should be the first speed in the church as described here to describe buchanan's era i use the phrase lay liberal christian these were christians who lived their lives not by rules and doctrines but by a generalized sense of transcendence and love for self and neighbor. Now, you really see something of American morality shaped in that. 
ensconced in a position of economic and social power, they felt no tension with their environment. They no longer looked to convert others. And what's, what's interesting about that is you have this decline of, of this one aspect of evangelicalism as a conversionist religion. There are those who are saved and those who are not. There are those who are Christians, and a Christian is known by their overt, specific, professed faith, and someone who can't really say that, and then what tends to happen in evangelical churches is that the stakes sort of rise. You know, okay, you say you're a Christian, but do you go to church? Do you tithe? Do you um, do you follow the, the Christian moral sexual ethic? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. As a result, mainline Protestants forsook loyalty to any one denomination or to any single religious subculture. In particular, parents no longer demanded or expected that their children should attend church, a trend that ensured that their youth would drift away from church as well. As Hogue, Johnson, and Ludens described in their 1994 Vanishing Boundaries, the religion of mainline Protestant baby boomers, these trends created a flaccid and benign ideological identity with, which led inexorably to the continuing deteriorationing and weakening of the, of the Protestant mainline denominations. An interesting contrast would be, at the same time, similar things are happening in evangelicalism. This, and, and again, you can read about this in Molly Wortham's book. Evangelicalism was sort of this balkanized, patchwork of intense little denominations that were separated by some pretty specific beliefs. And what evangelicalism and the rise of the neo-evangelicals tries to do is sort of reduce those differences and rally around certain things like Bible-believing Christians. And, and I think increasingly what we've seen are certain moral tells. Now we're going to see the rise of that in, in progressive Christianity today certain moral tells and moral professions. And, and in many ways, morality is increasingly, and I think we're going to see this in Yancey's book, morality around a few key things that are in the public sphere will increasingly be tells in terms of religiosity. At the time when I published the book, I argued that Fourth Presbyterian was a counterexample of this decline, and its continued vitality made the point. However, its inability to attract power brokers, to challenge city business, or to send young people out in mission to the world illustrated a religious body fully accommodated to their upper middle class milieu. Now, this is key because, in a sense, through sort of a subtle path of accommodation and success, they win the war. To be sure, the church embraced its socially progressive identity, supporting LGBTQ ordination and same-sex marriage. In 2012, its church rolls boasted 5,000 members, but attendance was far smaller. With Buchanan's retirement, Sunday attendance declined to 1,200 members at several services. In 2014, the Fourth Church called their first woman to be the pastor of the church. Now, when I talk about progressive liberationism, these kinds of boundary markers now become key in terms of the church's identity, and there's a strong tie to morality there. See, by calling this woman pastor, we demonstrate that we are pioneers. We are transcending boundaries. We are moving ahead into the future, into the eschaton. In some ways, it still remains the tie of their post-millennialism, but that's what everybody's paying attention to. Well, they now have a woman senior pastor. Yay! You know, okay, but that's the morality. That's the yardstick that they're using to measure. And then, of course, the first openly gay pastor. And then, you know, kind of the oppression Olympics trajectory sort of starts to kick in. 
The Reverend Shannon Kirshner. Kirshner, a Southern Presbyterian, has a dynamic personality and fits the lay liberal ethos of Fourth Presbyterian. She is comfortable with doubts and is clear that Christianity is not the only way. The question, of course, is way to what? Or as she says, no, God's not a Christian. I mean, we are. For me, the Christian tradition is the way to understand God and my relationship with the world and other humans, but I'm not about to say what God can and cannot do in other ways and with other spiritual experiences. For Kirshner, Christianity is one way among many paths to truth. As an egalitarian and liberal Protestant, she was critical of Donald Trump's behavior leading up to the 2016 presidential election. Of course, Trump became another litmus test for many churches and leaders, and more generally willing to make her case for moderate left-leaning social and cultural vision. Fourth Presbyterian's current leaders do not expect the church to lead the city or its pastors to be talking with mayors or the president. They do want intellectually, now now again, looking at this presidential connection, remember at Obama's first inaugural, Rick Warren, you know, sometimes called America's pastor, this is Obama's presidency. Rick Warren gave the prayer. Now at his 2012 inauguration, they were going to have Giglio, but again, Giglio's position on same-sex marriage had him disinvited from Obama's second inaugural. you got, you know, pay attention to these things. They are tells of things. The church had once led the city and influenced a nation now constituted an upper middle class enclave with neither the ambition nor the energy to change the world, much less a city. When I moved to Seattle in 1997, I, had, I intended to follow my study of Fourth Presbyterian with a similar analysis of the churches on the West Coast. I assumed I would be able to track down an even greater number of thriving mainline liberal churches in a part of the country known for its liberal politics and culture. To my surprise, I was wrong. I could only identify a few vibrant liberal churches that were managing to grow. In the process of looking, however, I came across a veritable cavalcade of prospering evangelical churches in the heart of the Pacific Northwest. Indeed, in 1999 and 2001, the Evangelical Louis Palau Ministries in Portland and Seattle led two of the largest public, ga- public gatherings in the Pacific Northwest. Evangelical churches had not only gained a foothold in the region, but they had nearly doubled in size while mainline congregations had declined by more than half since the 1980s. I published these findings in my 2008 monograph, Evangelical vs. Liberal, The Clash of Christian Culture in the Pacific Northwest. I examined 12 vital liberal congregations and 24 thriving evangelical congregations. My, My criteria for vital liberal churches were simply churches that were not failing, and that had either grown or maintained their membership and budget for at least the previous three years. It's not a long time in terms of watching churches. The liberal church membership averaged 280 members, and the congregations averaged $500,000 in their annual budgets. My guess is that many of these liberal churches had a lot more money than people, giving less than 10% of their funds to missions. The sample of 24 evangelical churches, on the other hand, included churches that had nearly doubled in size over a five-year period, averaging $2 million annual budgets and 13% in annual missions giving. While most of the liberal churches had no active missionaries, again, that's telling in terms of the faith, the evangelical congregations averaged nearly 10 permanent international missionaries with more individuals and small groups committed to short-term mission work. But the stunning difference between the evangelical and the liberal churches was in the kind of social service churches social service churches offered their communities. This is really fascinating. In the process of doing the research, we interviewed nearly 150 liberal lay members and clergy and nearly 300 evangelical lay people and ministers. 
Through coding this data, it became clear to me that the evangelical churches did much more than liberal churches in day-to-day -day social service to their communities. Now, this is absolutely fascinating, unsurprising to me, but think about it this way. Members of the evangelical church would like to love on their neighbors themselves and have that personal experience. In many ways, the liberal churches want to do it through outsourced organizations or through the government, which is really interesting because, in a sense, in the evangelical churches, the acts of kindness and service to the lowest and the least of these is voluntary, whereas in the liberal churches, it's done through your tax money. In other words, in some ways, these mainline churches are sort of acting like state churches. It's a really interesting thing. In nearly every evangelical interview, there were reports of individuals and groups serving those in need, a trend which was much less common in the liberal congregations. If they spoke about service, liberals mentioned LGBTQ rights or urban homelessness, but they rarely spoke about engaging in direct service for others. While liberals often belonged to formal, service-oriented community groups, evangelicals were overwhelmingly doing the work for others in small, informal neighborhood groups. I think he's dead on right. That's certainly my experience. It became apparent that researchers are not aware of evangelical service, in large part because evangelicals do most of their service through informal networks. In one case, a group of evangelical retirees gathered once a week to paint houses for the elderly in their various neighborhoods. Because of the format of their service, there were few points of contact with local service organizations. On the other hand, liberals spoke a great deal in abstract terms about caring for the poor, particularly homeless and sexual minorities, but they rarely mentioned concrete direct service to others. Eight of the 24 evangelical churches in my evangelical versus liberal study are megachurches. At the time, I would say that megachurches are a relatively new phenomenon in the American religious landscape. And while it's true that megachurches emerged in the public imagination in the wake of cultural change of the 1960s, as we've seen, they are not new at all. Furthermore, the number of megachurches has exploded since the 1970s and has steadily increased since. Between 1990 and 2000, the total number of megachurches in the United States increased from 350 to 600. Today, there are more than 1,600, and there is no indication that the trend is slowing. In fact, while the median congregation size of the American church is about 75 active members, more than 50% of all churchgoers attend the largest 10% of churches in America. Based on a large sample of qualitative and quantitative surveys originally executed by the Leadership Network and our own observations of megachurch services, Part 2 examines how megachurch members experience and evaluate their lives in these institutions. Now the next cut, the next section, which I'm, I don't think I'll read, is basically an argument that while everyone tends to look at a lot of these symptoms that you can see from the outside, what's really going on are the emotions or the affect. As we've seen before, American Protestantism has always shifted back and forth between the values of the Puritans and the Pietists, or in more contemporary vernacular, the mind and the emotion. From the perspective of theologians, this may be true, but on the ground, in the pew, with the perspective of congregational studies in American history, the true winner has always been the emotional capacity of a religious culture. Even in Jonathan Edwards' time, the question was about authenticity of religious affection, and the revivalist George Whitefield and the pietism of the Wesleys won the day, both in numbers and in influence. Some, and here we mean Protestant elites, have claimed that the contemporary movement towards emotion and affection is new, but we have shown that this has not always been a primary way, that this has always been a primary way that Americans have responded to faith. In the senior author study, the movement towards churches that evoke an expressive response has been telling. 
Americans want to feel something, whether it is a sense of connection, the ecstasy of Christian contemporary worship, or that feeling of the ultimate that is the legacy of Frederick Schleiermacher's liberal theology. And what where he will go in this is demonstrate how megachurches and megachurch pastors are expert in this. Now, for the sake of this video, we want to keep our eye on this when it comes to moral, and I'm going to argue, we're going to define these things as religious movements that are in fact not housed within churches. A couple of videos ago, I... Let me move this thing. A couple of videos ago, I took a look at Worldwide Wrestling. And I've been watching some videos about Worldwide Wrestling. When I was in high school, I would clean up in the back of a, a bakery. And me and my buddy, who cleaned with me, he introduced me to wrestling. And so I started watching some wrestling on the TV that was, we didn't have cable TV or anything. It was on broadcast TV in the New York metropolitan area. And I think Vince McMahon at that point was still a wrestler, if I remember correctly. I think he was part of a tag team. And as high school kids, you know, the question was, is this real? Is this not real? Going to talk about that in a minute. But anybody who watches wrestling, knows that this is a morality play. Now look at those words. What do we mean? That Hitman Heart documentary, which I linked and caused a little bit of trouble in terms of copyright claims and such on a previous video. I, I very much recommend the video. It's, it's a video that Jordan Peterson has recommended a number of times. It's there on YouTube that you can watch. It was done by a, a Canadian... It, 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 now that I know, its rights are owned by this Canadian, Canadian documentary thing. Um, fans go to it to participate in morality. And again, for that reason, it looks deeply religious. Now, I know a lot of people are like, no, religion is about ancient books and supernaturalism, yada, yada, yada. You just watch the fans of Worldwide Wrestling. And it's passion, it's morality, it's tribal, it's good versus evil, right versus wrong. Fans go to participate and live within the drama. Now, one of the issues that I found, which I'll put the link to in below, which was really quite interesting, was the day kayfabe died in wrestling explained. Now, in the 1920s and 30s, newspapers, and there are a lot of very interesting videos on the history of wrestling, newspapers stopped printing who won matches. Why? Because people began to get aware that, unlike, let's say, when the, when the Broncos and the Ravens play, or the Jets and the Pats play, Nobody knows the outcome, and so there's betting, and there's fantasy football, and there's all these things. And part of what's fun about football is football's sort of hard to predict because there's so many moving pieces. But what do we mean by it's fake? Well, what's fake about it? Well, it's not a sports competition. And in fact, there's a lot of interesting lawsuits that Vince McMahon, who really sort of coalesced wrestling and brought it to the fore, he was very open. He said, this is entertainment. Well, that's interesting. What is entertainment in America? I think it's increasingly religious. It's not merely a diversion. It's something that we can participate in. It's really spirits in action. The, the outcome of the match is predetermined by brains, unlike real sports. The industry exploded a number of years ago. Um, millions and millions of fans, billions of dollars of revenue. And it's all been in decline, which is interesting. And there's another video, 10 Reasons Why Fans Stopped Watching worldwide WWE. Now, 
it wasn't because Geraldo Rivera, I think that was, or no, it was John Stossel, did an expose as if that was necessary on whether wrestling is real. It was a fundamental misunderstanding of exactly what was happening in front of all of our eyes. But the questions of why it's in decline are equally interesting. And, and when you listen to the reasons, most of the answers have to do with things like talent and compelling characters. Many of the answers given are similar to what punditry would sort of put out there with respect to why people are no longer interested, as interested in um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe or Star Wars or Harry Potter or a, a other character franchises or fandoms. You, you very much get the sense that WWE was, in many ways, sort of much more on that side of things, which is, of course, exactly what Vince McMahon was saying it was. So, and it's very interesting, Trump's relationship to all of this is quite fascinating. It's sort of like why some books sell and some books don't, why some movies are popular and some movies are not. But again, you can't watch Hitman Heart and not get a sense of, isn't this a religion? Sort of. Aren't these morality plays? Don't we long to participate in the triumph of the good guy and the humiliation and defeat of the bad guy? And all of the scripting, it's just as scripted as Marvel Cinematic Universe. But the whole kayfabe is part of the drama. Just like when you watch these actors dressed up as superheroes, you don't really think. See, and that word then gets sort of fuzzy. Now, morality and politics, politics is all about morality. You know, the big story today, um, these border officers using their reins to whip Haitian migrants and try and keep some order there. Uh, Ryan Long, who does comedy, had a very interesting little tweet with a little video on nation-building masterclasses. Morality is Politics is a morality play in many ways. And it's interesting that, well, perhaps worldwide wrestling is down because national politics has sort of slid in there. Trump, in a sense, took a step up and went from playing morality in the ring to playing morality on CNN and MSNBC and Fox and in the real newspapers. But what is morality? Morality is not an easy thing. It has to do with what we should do and what we shouldn't do. But why? And towards what end? And how are we supposed to know these things? How does it relate to religion? How do we participate in it? And again, just in the wake of in the wake of George Floyd, everyone paused and watched everyone take a knee. And it was almost like, well, Jesus camp was breaking out in the streets of America. But whereas the same people who would have been snickering and mocking Jesus camp were the ones taking a knee and raising their fists and doing everything that happened in Jesus camp on the streets of America. We do these things, but if you ask people, why are you doing this? Tell me what it causes. Well, they'll struggle and they'll be vague. You know, how does, how many lives are saved if you kneel? And in fact, in some ways, George Floyd was killed by a police officer kneeling on him. Is your public prayer efficacious in a way that you are doubtful about prayer in general? Or is it the laws that must change 
in order for morality to come about? And what is that morality intended to bring? Now, in my question and answer on last Friday, someone clued me into Adam and Sitch and Sargon, a patient apparently visited their nearly 12-hour live stream, if you thought I go long. And this is Adam's favorite subject. I've talked to Adam a couple of times about this. Esther has a lot that Adam loves to talk about this question of objective morality. Um, and I don't particularly like the term because I don't think the word objective is helping him tease out the pieces that I think he wants to. And this doesn't mean I'm a relativist. Now, Adam and Sitch basically take the success approach that morality is seen objectively to the degree that actions which are felt, participated in, and coded as right achieve success out in the world. And when I talked to Adam about this, he noted that the failure and decline of Nazi Germany was because, basically, their objective morality was less than the morality of the Soviet Union and the Western democracies. Hence, they lost the war. So morality can be judged by how successful it is. Now, there are two problems with this. One problem is the timeline problem in which many things seem successful given a particular time frame and achieving a particular goal. Let's say eating a diet of strictly ice cream and hamburgers, which I would enjoy, seems successful in making me happy, but it may not be terribly successful in making me happy long term if it leads to heart disease and diabetes. So... Should I eat ice cream? Should I eat hamburgers? Time frame is really quite important. Um, they had a big debate on the video about the Mongols. And again, for a while, the Mongols were an enormously successful civilization until they weren't. Does that speak of their morality? Now, success is also a value judgment. And so in some ways, you're trying to assess value judgments by value judgments. Um, cancer sort of makes a good analogy because in as compared to the other cells in your body, cancer cells are more successful if you judge success by growth. This gets into a lot of things in America because we tend to look at Apple Corporation as successful because they sell a lot of iPhones and they dominate the tech industry. But we tend to have this imagination that success is all about sort of having a runaway train. Apple would not, you see this in nature, if let's say a certain niche in the ecosystem, let's say rabbits, rabbits sort of have a boon year and there's rabbits everywhere and then they tend to outstrip the capacity of the environment. Then you have this rabbit population collapse and then slowly it builds up and they explode, and they collapse, is that successful? Well, you have to ask, well, what would be the metric of success for rabbits? Now, if you had a rabbit farmer who was raising rabbits for fur and meat, then you probably wouldn't want this boom and bust cycle. You would probably want sort of a measured sustainability cycle that, in fact, would reduce economic costs in keeping rabbits, and maximize the food and fur goals of rabbits. And so success isn't really a great standard. Sargon sort of used an inherent dignity argument, which, you know, Adam and Sitch sort of jumped on as this sounds awfully religious. Sex with an animal is degrading, but that, of course, assumes a certain dignity in human beings. You're not going to find that dignity in science, of course. You will have to find that dignity subjectively, and that then sort of falls into the objective-subjective pit that a lot of these arguments fall into. It harms a child. Well, 
It used to be that we believed that same-sex relationships were, in fact, degrading and that, in fact, they would harm children. I don't mean they believe that gays would harm children, but that this was harmful to children until, of course, the decision was made that, well, no, this is only degrading because we think it's degrading. And so now, of course, it's swept, or it's swept around, and the assertion being given is that it's equally dignified as heterosexual relationships. It's not degrading, it's sacred. That's the flip. In some ways, it is similar to the weakness argument in Adam's argument, in that, well, how do you know? It begs an imaginative it begs at imagining a a perfect impartial moral judge in some ways. And I think Sargon wants to argue that it's self-evident, and perhaps he would try and back that up with evolutionary psychology has sort of bequeathed us an imagination of the sacred and the secular, and we figure things out from there. It's sort of a monarchical moral vision. Objective, of course, is difficult, and what Adam, I think, is looking for is something that won't bend to subjective desire, um, something against which subjective desire can be evaluated, sort of the straight edge to judge the crooked stick. But the problem, of course, is we can make no judgment without perspectival perception. We don't have a monarchical moral vision, and so they tend to go round and round, and by virtue of the fact that success itself has difficulties in terms of being viewed as objective, the debate goes on. Now, Adam is a big is a big fan of Jonathan Haidt, and this is an attempt to sort of lay things down in an evolutionary psychology framework. And for many of us, before I ever discovered Jordan Peterson, I discovered Jonathan Haidt, and I had read his books, but Jonathan Haidt wasn't on YouTube like Jordan Peterson. You can find a few videos of him on YouTube, but he's not like Jordan Peterson was on YouTube. And so his books got some attention, but didn't really make the big splash that Jordan did. Haidt basically argues that morality is, I'm going to use philosophical language, properly basic for human beings. In other words, you should just consider it sort of a given that we have these moral intuitions and moral taste buds and that these have arisen through generation after generation after generation of 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 evolution and selection and it sort of gets i think and this is part of the reason i think adam makes his argument that this is in a sense how it's objective even though it doesn't seem specifically objective enough to necessarily settle our disputes especially in particular cases it's an adaptive experience that arises naturally in other words, again, read C.S. Lewis's Miracle on Natural. What do you mean by that? It does so unbiddingly, okay? There, there seems to be no human intentionality about it. Spontaneously and is nearly universal with notable exceptions, meaning psychopaths. But the exception proves the rule. We will disagree on specifics and applications, but we won't abandon that there are rules, now, C.S. Lewis, of course, writes a fair amount about this. There's an argument from moral experience that C.S. Lewis begins his book Mere Christianity with. C.S. Lewis begins the book version of his World War II radio series with the argument for the existence of God from a moral, from objective morality, if you will, even though I don't like the word. None of us deny that there is a moral law that is in the universe that we can hold each other to. People say you're wrong. And when you're doing that, you're holding someone to a standard that is not even between the people. You're holding them to a standard that is above both of the people. This is sort of what Adam is getting at with his word objective. Adam wants to leverage its objectiveness 
to get at the details of this in order to hold each other accountable and to work together um, better with it. And sort of the, the carrot then on the end of the stick is success. If you are moral, you will succeed. Well, a lot of that depends on you because if your morality is too costly towards other successes that you are looking towards, you might abandon your morality, take a shortcut, and try to gain your success immorally. And this is sort of where Sargon comes into the fact and says, that's not morality because cheating works. Lewis argues that it is reasonable to presuppose a lawgiver given by this fact, and you can read the argument in the book. Now, now one of my favorite chapters of C.S. Lewis's popular works is, in fact, the beginning of the problem of pain, because he knits together this argument of the strange union in the religion of the Bible between the numinous and the moral. And it's, I've read it in previous videos. It's really a fascinating chapter. It, it very much connects with um, the conversation I had with J.P. Marceau and John Verveke. And in, in a way, he argues that morality itself is sort of properly basic. What do I mean by properly basic? So I'll put a link to one of um, Alvin Plantinga's little quips on Veritas Forum about that. I'm not going to play it because every time I play a Veritas Forum film, Veritas Forum is very protective about their, um, about their content online. I think universal is a better description of objective um, just because I think we put too much on the word objective. So... What Lewis has to says is, say is this. Now, the numinous, the numinous is sort of this experience of awe. It's, it's what we experience if we think we see a ghost. It's, it's the experience of the enchanted or haunted universe. And he makes the argument that in antiquity, these two things were separate, that the numinous and the moral were separate. And in the religion of the Bible, from the Hebrews, for the first time, they come together. It's a very interesting argument. The numinous is not the same as the morally good. And a man overwhelmed with awe is likely, if left, if left to himself, to think the numinous object beyond good and evil. And you'll hear a lot of that in psychedelic talk and, and some of these things. This, is, this brings us to the second strand or element in religion. All the human beings that history has heard of acknowledge some kind of morality. That is, they feel toward certain proposed actions the experiences expressed by the words I ought or I ought not. These experiences resemble awe in one respect, namely that they cannot be logically deduced from the environment and a physical experience of the man who undergoes them. And, and this is sort of cutting against Adam's argument because you don't logically deduce morality from the environment. That's not how you experience it. You experience it pre-rationally and I don't know, Height is a favorite with Adam. Height would argue that, in fact, the rider on the elephant, the rider is the post hoc explainer to the moral elephant who has long, who has already made up his mind. And in that sense, morality isn't something we deduce from experience necessarily. It's something that we feel it comes from the inside. And then back to Wellman, it's very much affective. It has to do with our emotions. And just watch conversations about morality. It just feels wrong. And I often point to Soul Searching, Christian Smith's book about morality in America and American youth. Part of the reason Americans believe morality is self-evident is because they experience it that way. They have a moral compass. Now, what's interesting is that People can change their minds about morality, and often do, but even when they change their minds after thinking something through, they still experience their new morality as, Americans would say, authentic. 
It's pre-rational. It's, it's something deeper than the arguments we give. And I think part of Sargon's argument is going to be supported by where Lewis is going to go with this. And so there's a little bit for Adam in here and some things that aren't nice. And there's a little bit for Sargon in here and some things that aren't nice. These experience... Um, you can shuffle, I want, and I am forced, and I shall be well advised, and I dare not, as long as you please, without getting out of them the slightest hint of ought and ought not. And once again, attempts to resolve the moral experience into something else always presuppose the very thing they are trying to explain. As when a famous psychoanalyst de um, deduced it from prehistoric parasite. If the parasite produces a sense of guilt, that was because men felt that they ought not to have committed it. If they did not do so feel, if they if they did not so feel, it could produce no sense of guilt. Morality, like numinous awe, is a jump. In it, man goes beyond anything that can be given in the facts of experience. And this is sort of testified to Sargon's assertion of things like dignity and sacred. And so when you listen to Sargon talk, he's very much arguing that it's basic, but he, he doesn't doesn't really sound like he has the words for that. He's he's basically asserting that it's again, it's part of the inherent dignity. And it has one characteristic too remarkable to be ignored, and this is the key one. The moralities accepted among men may differ, though not at bottom so widely as often claimed, sort of a point for Adam's objectivism, but they all agree in prescribing a behavior which their adherents fail to practice. And this is the strange thing. This is an incredibly strange thing, because if the rider on the elephant is a post hoc justifier for the behavior that the moralistic elephant has already decided, why do groups of elephants create moral systems that they know they can't keep? This is where we begin to get into my video about the ideal, because that's what ideals are. Ideals are moral aspirations we know we will fail. That is a strange thing. If I'm deciding to play a board game with my children, and I want to win, which I do, and I am constructing the game, I may well decide that I would like to construct to the game in a way that I will always win. That's not how we play moral games. This is the strangest point. I remember the first time I read this in Lewis, it was just like, I've got to read this again. And every time I read it, I have the same experience. This is a very strange thing. It sort of argues for Adam's objectivity because it runs against our wills. But it's, again, it's something that's pre-rational that we experience. is sort of like how Sargon, the point that Sargon is making. All men alike stand condemned, not by alien codes of ethics, but by their own. And all men, therefore, are conscious of guilt. There's a little sermon illustration that people use because sort of in the matrix of Protestant theology, People will say things like, I'm, an a better, I'm a better than average person morally. And of course, Protestants sort of point to an ideal, but they say, can you fulfill the law? And well, I have quibbles about what's in your law. And so then the question is, well, let's imagine that, well, I'm going to update it for cell phones. Let's imagine that your phone, every time you say something that someone else should do, your cell phone records it. Google's listening. It goes into Google. It goes into Google Keep. Let's imagine it goes into the cloud. Let's imagine at the end of your life, you're only judged against how you judged others. Would you still pass? 
most of us looking at other people would say, I doubt it. All men stand condemned, not by alien codes of ethics, but by their own. And all men, therefore, are conscious of guilt. The second element in religion is the consciousness not merely of a moral law, but of a moral law at once approved and disobeyed. This consciousness is neither a logical nor an illogical inference from the facts of experience. It's pre-experiential. If we did not bring it to our experience, we could not find it there. It is either an explicit, it is either an explicit, an ex, it is either an explicable illusion or else revelation. When Jordan Peterson got back into his second wave, one of his early themes was conscience. And he was often sort of making intimations about the existence of the divine by virtue of the conscience. And he brings it up in his talk with Peugeot and in a, a couple of his very first talks. He kept talking about the fact that we have these consciences and we can't seem to shut them up. Reasonably, we would imagine we could quell them. And if you add Lewis's observation to this, it really comes together because he notes that our consciences condemn us for codes that we approve of. This is a very strange thing. Again, Adam tries to get at this by saying objective. Sargon tries to get at this by saying implicit, pre-conscious, but I don't know if Sargon sort of has, he, he defaults again to religious language, sacred. Now, downstream from Abrahamic religions, we sort of assume origin, religion, and morality are triggered. I ought to minimize suffering in the world. I ought to perform my sacrifices to the gods. And, and there's this spirit that takes on that's, that's basically what we talk about by the experience of being triggered. A spirit takes me over. Just go back and look at my video about the stitching together of heaven and earth by ideals instantiated, re-idealized in hagiography back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and collectively, communally. So when the worldwide wrestlers go on stage and act out these dramas... They, they wear the costumes of archetypes and they play them on stage. And here's the amazing thing. If you get the, the expensive seats, you can reach out and touch the archetype. Now keep the cameras out of backstage and please don't show me the, the, the showman riding together in the limousine. We need to believe that Look at Native American spirituality. We need to believe that when the wrestlers put on their clothing, they become gods in our presence. And the trials and the wars of the gods happen on stage. When we go and watch the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we participate in the war of the gods. And we want to see Thanos defeated by Iron Man and his crew of moral do-gooders. A spirit of morality and justice takes me over, and I, with my mob, with my group, try to bring justice by my own hands. Those who storm the Capitol, whether you agree with them or not, thought they were bringing justice. The police that were barricading them did their duty in order to maintain justice. The lawgivers inside the building tried to do justice by following the sacred rites and rituals and routines within the American religious, moral, political universe. I want to go back to this video that I thought about this video a lot. You had um, you had Stephen Smith, Tara Isabella Burton, and Ross Douthat from the American Enterprise Institute, and it's a it's a terrific video. The whole thing. 
Smith notes the shift from goaling transcendence to the imminent frame as a tell for the return of paganism. Of course, Christianity afforded such a vivid afterlife in images of resurrection. For Christianity, the resurrection begins on that first Easter Sunday, and all other saints who die in Christ anticipate being raised like Jesus did, raised with a physical body where that can be touched, that can consume a fish, etc., etc. And so part of what Steve Smith looked at is said, Christendom creates many more transcendent things. Paganism sort of puts things back down to earth. But there's always those tensions between heaven and earth in Christianity. And so here we have the secular and the religious. And again, I think in, in the Protestant world, the church sort of becomes heaven and the secular becomes the earthly side. And you have the different speeds. Church people are supposed to be more moral than people who are unchurched. There's a fascinating, um, there's a fascinating story told by an atheist who, when asked, if you were leaving Heathrow Airport late one night, or any airport, and you were concerned about getting taken advantage of by a cabbie, would you prefer a cabbie who had a Bible on his dashboard to one who did not? And right there you begin to see the connection between religion and morality. We're all aghast when Roman Catholic priests abuse children. We don't like it when school children, when schools do, when school teachers do, but Nobody's going around saying schools ought to be abolished and you're evil if you send your children to school. Well, some are. But secularism has worked in this direction. And, and you can see the shift um, in instrumental moralizing. So again, morality, and you see this actually in Adam's argument, morality is about success down here on earth. Whereas in some ways, Sargon's argument is sanctity, becoming sacred. Now, of course, Sargon is not leaning towards a heaven, but he's sort of on the top there, and Adam's on the bottom in terms of secularity. Now, I just started reading Brett and Heather's book, A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. Uh, good, good writers. Um, I, I kind of wondered how they would be, but um, so far the book is enjoyable. But we come down again to where we always find Brett with respect to this question of morality, because Brett always seems to simply assume he knows the good, and where he gets it from looks to me like he's getting it from simply the flow of Judeo-Christian history in the West, but, but again, Brett and Heather are moderates with respect to religion. And, you know, they, they've produced some very interesting conversations lately. First, I'm going to read a little bit from the sample, and you can just download the sample from Amazon. First principles are those whose assumptions cannot be deduced from any other assumption. Sort of properly basic. They are foundational like axioms in math, and so thinking from first principles is a powerful mechanism for deducing truth. But now, right away when we sort of think about that and applying it to morality, things get a little squirrely. A worthy goal if you are interested in fact over fiction, very much the modernist frame. Among many benefits of first principles thinking is that it helps one avoid um, falling prey to the naturalistic fallacy, which is the idea that what is in nature is what ought to be. And again, part of the weakness is they simply assume a lot of what ought to be ought to what end. And especially Brett with his genocidal spelling bee, never can really, I'm never really satisfied listening to him try to address it. He doesn't I don't really hear him address it much. The framework that we present here 
is built to free us from these sorts of traps. It is intended to allow us humans to make sense of ourselves that we can at minimum protect ourselves from self-inflicted harm, seems to be more of the Adam success thing. In this book, we will identify the most large-scale problems of our time. But again, a problem is a matter of a value judgment. And where do we get these value judgments from? In this book, we'll identify most large-scale problems over time, not through the limiting, divisive lens of politics, but through the indiscriminate lens of our evolution. And again, I, I often find there's, there's just sort of a self-contradictory element when, whenever he talks about morality, and he just sort of wanders into it glibly. The universality of morality does not mean that our detailed moralities are self-evident. If, if Sam Harris were right about the obviousness of well-being, one wonders why, in fact, we can't seem to agree not only on what leads to well-being, but also why we get so passionate about the failure of others to agree with our particulars or their stubbornness in opposing our solutions. Now, of course, Utilitarianism is famous for this kind of thing. Utilitarianism in, in normative ethics is a tradition stemming from the late 18th and 19th century English philosopher, economist Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mills, according to which an action or type of action is right if it tends to promote happiness. Now, one might ask, how do happiness and success relate? Or pleasure and wrong if it tends to produce unhappiness or pain. Not just for the performer of the action, but also for everyone else affected by it. Utilitarianism is a species of consequentialism, the general doctrine in ethics that actions or types of actions should be evaluated on the basis of their consequences. Now, again, the reason we have a word for it is because it's debated. Utilitarianism and other consequentialist theories are in opposition to egoism, the view that each person should pursue his or her own self-interest even at the expense of others, and any ethical theory that regards some actions or type of actions as right or wrong independently of their consequences. See Deontological Ethics. Utilitarianism often differs from ethical systems that make the rightness or wrongness of an action dependent on the motive of the agent. For according to the utilitarianism, it is impossible for the right thing to be done for a bad motive. Utilitarians may, however, distinguish the aptness of praising or blaming an agent from whether the action was right. What this type of thing tends to invite is something very common today, which is sort of doing the math on suffering. And I would argue that suffering is extraordinarily math resistant. Even though if you are in pain, your nurse or doctor might walk into the room and ask you on a scale of one to 10 to describe the pain, suffering is a particularly difficult thing. You can look at Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and watch a bunch of, so of spoiled children who are absolutely suffering by not being permanently indulged. And then you can look at, you know, the little boy who, little Charlie, who is growing up in poverty and, of course, well, lots of other things get triggered. Um, he, of course, is generous and healthy and he does stumble, but in the end, he wins the Chocolate Factory. Suffering is tremendously difficult to figure out because suffering is purely subjective. And what we tend to default into are decisions of whose suffering is justified. Because in almost every conflict, to resolve the conflict, someone is going to be suffering more than the other person. And if relieving suffering is really the only goal left to you, where will you go? I just had the, the conversation with um, with Nick Lonan, and I thought it was a lovely conversation. But this whole math suffering always seems to be a funny thing in debates like this. If, for example, the vast majority of people who are not same-sex attracted, let's say half of those people who are not same-sex attracted, which be 
would, would be comparatively a far larger number of people than those who are, um, would suffer if they were told that they were wrong about this idea. You compare that to same-sex attracted people who suffer if they're told they're wrong about the idea. Well, if you sort of do the math and multiply some question of suffering by the number of people, then certainly whoever is in the majority should get their way because by definition, there would be less suffering in the world. But of course, nobody believes this math and with good reason because Here's the question. You can't do math on suffering like this. It, it simply doesn't work. And really, sort of implicitly, where the debate is always where the debate is always brought, it's who justifiably will we cause to suffer by the decision we make collectively? So this group of sufferers, we will say, too bad, you're wrong, you must suffer. Well, why should wrongness and suffering be connected? Because often, the moral decision, as we all know, is the decision to suffer, usually suffering voluntarily. And so a lot of our debates are really just about justified suffering. Now, I haven't listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson videos lately, but I've been following Rob Henderson for quite a while on Twitter, often really enjoying his tweets. He's a student, and so he'll often tweet out little captions of books, and I often find um, the things that he's tweeting out quite interesting, and I've been thoroughly enjoying his conversation with Jordan Peterson. And he gets into the question of luxury beliefs, which is really luxury morality and luxury religion. No problem. So let's talk first of all about luxury beliefs and exactly what that means and how you came uh, come up with the idea and what the consequence of disseminating it has been. Yes. So the luxury beliefs idea I define as ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while often inflicting costs on the lower social classes. And I mean, there are multiple strands to this idea, but it originally started with my observations in undergrad at Yale. Um, so as you said, you know, currently I'm a grad student at Cambridge. Before this, I was a student at Yale. But before that, my life was a lot different. Uh, I grew up in foster homes in LA. Later, I was adopted into uh, a working class town in Northern California, served in the military. So I just had a completely... A little later in the thing, he talks about Red Bluff. So if you go up five from Sacramento, Corning, Red Bluff, when he mentioned that, I thought, yeah, that's, uh, these are, um, these are, this isn't, this isn't Beverly Hills. Different uh, set of life experiences and background than many of my peers uh, at, at this Ivy League university. And in that New York Post essay, the the original luxury beliefs essay, I opened with this story of uh, this conversation I had with a classmate of mine in undergrad. Uh, we were sort of talking about relationships and career. And she said to me, you know, I, I just think monogamy is outdated. I just think it's you know not really good for society. I think it's just this sort of old patriarchal way of thinking. And I'd heard things like this before, but this time I asked her, um, well, what do you plan to do? You know, what do you want to do with, with your own life and with your own relationship situation and, and so on in the future? And she herself said, well, I'd like to get married and settle down and have a family at some point, you know, sort of after my career takes off. And I asked her, well, what was your life like before that? You know, how did you grow up? And essentially she had come from a very stable, intact two parent family. And so this puzzled me because this was uh, emblematic of so many of the opinions I'd heard of my uh, in undergrad from my peers. They would say one thing, they would believe this one set of interesting or unusual beliefs that I'd never heard before from anyone else. Uh, but then they themselves had come from sort of more conventional uh, upbringings, and they themselves planned to have that kind of life, that sort of uh, more stable traditional family. I'd once heard someone put this way that, um, you know, a, a lot of sort of affluent people, they, uh, what is it, they walk the 50s and talk the 60s. And I wondered, you know, what's going on here? Um, 
And so while I was an undergrad, I came across a series of papers, a series of ideas, both from psychology and sociology. So these sort of sociological aspects, um, I drew this from Thorsten Veblen. And Veblen's idea, you know, he wrote the theory of the leisure class in the late 19th century. And he basically said that, you know, the elites of his day, they broadcast their status with their material goods, with, you know, expensive clothes, tuxedos, uh, evening gowns. They take up these very uh, expensive and time consuming hobbies like golf or beagling. And all of this is to basically indicate their high social position. And, you know, some people say this book was written sort of tongue in cheek, but I think there's a lot of truth to this. Now, if we fast forward to the modern day, uh, I think it's there are two things going on with why it's not actually fashionable anymore to display your status with luxury goods, with material goods. Um, number one, I think it's become viewed as kind of gauche. If you walk around an Ivy League campus today, the students don't look like they don't have the Ivy look of like the 1950s or the 1960s. They kind of just look like regular college students, number one. And I mean, this is true pretty much anywhere. If you look at very wealthy people and the f famous example of this would be Mark Zuckerberg wearing uh, cargo shorts and a hoodie. It's just not that cool anymore to wear clothes that indicate that you're high social status. The other thing is material goods have become more affordable. Um, you know, even my sort of poor and working class friends back home, all of them have iPhones. Um, you know, maybe, they, of course, like their lives aren't as comfortable as my peers in college, but a lot of material goods have become so affordable that it's become harder to stand out in that way. Yeah, and you so see my that claim, reflected, I think, to some degree in the decline in burglary. Oh, right. right. Material objects mm -hmm. just aren't as worth as much as they were. And so they don't distinguish between people anymore. It's not worth it anymore uh, to steal things. And and so so that's uh, that, that's the aspect of it that led me to think, OK, well, first of all, you know, luxury goods are not being displayed as much by the upper class. But I still think it still seems to me they care very much about social status. And this is where the psychology aspect of it comes in from a um, researcher named Cameron Anderson at UC Berkeley. He's a psychologist who found uh, he, he and his colleagues found that um, basically the upper class cares the most about social status. Um, they care the most about obtaining it and they care the most about preserving it, which at first I thought was a bit counterintuitive. I thought that perhaps the, the most downtrodden, the kind of uh, people who, who are in the lowest rungs of society would care the most about obtaining money and wealth and status, but that's actually not true. It's the people who are already at the top who care the most about it. And that's really what I saw at Yale too, uh, where you know, these people were very much, they were strivers. Um, they were very interested in pursuing status. Do you suppose that's a partial consequence of the fact that failure is perhaps more painful than success is rewarding? So once you have it, let's say you have high social status, you're very much inclined to keep it because the alternative would be so, I suppose in some sense, unthinkable so catastrophic for you? Right. So so this is the, the idea of uh, almost like this prospect theory idea that when you have it, it, it hurts you know, twice as much as, as obtaining it. I think there is something to this idea. Um, I noticed there was a, a lot of anxiety uh, among many of my peers, uh, this feeling that they have to keep up, they have to constantly strive, they have to get onto the next goal. And I think what exacerbates this feeling is that they're surrounded by people just like them. Uh, it, was, it was a bit unlike uh, my own experience. Um, when I had got into undergrad, I, um, I thought like, okay, so I'm okay. I got into college. Like that was my goal. I, I never thought I was ever going to get into college. And so when I got there, I thought like, oh, I'm okay. And then I saw that these people didn't feel okay, that they had to get the next internship. They had to get into law school. They had to do this. They had to do that. And I think a lot of it is because they're around people. They've grown up around those kinds of people their entire life. And so there's this belief, like it, it was inevitable. Like they always had to do this. There was never a question of their success. Right, right. Whereas for me, beginning. it wasn't like that. Yeah, well, when, All I, of this pressure. when I taught at, in Boston at Harvard, I mean, one of the things I noticed was that the students there were you know, they were pleased to be at Harvard. There was no doubt about that, but they, it was extremely competitive implicitly. And I suppose that's part of the consequence of it being essentially based as, as much as it could be on, on competitive merit. And so it was also the mm -hmm. case that many of these students had been outstanding where they had come from. They were class valedictorians and usually had at least one or two other major accomplishments under their belt. 
But then when they got to these intensely selected institutes, they were also, in some sense, average instantly and below average in many ways, because, you know, no matter how smart you are, the probability that you're the smartest person in your class at Harvard is pretty damn low. And so the implicit level of competition was extremely high. And so that might also exacerbate the sort of tendencies that you're describing. And people tend to compare themselves to their immediate peers, not to the broader world. Right. And and I, th and this is part of why I think is 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 driving this. Um, you know, I, I make this this point in the essay that their their Dunbar's number, you know, their the 150 closest people to them are 150 baby millionaires. And so if that's your social circle, then you feel this constant underlying tension to display your status in some way. And so my claim is that the affluent in large part have reattached or they sort of detached status to goods and reattached it to beliefs. Uh, and, and and again, it's these aren't just beliefs about math or beliefs about cosmology or beliefs about, I mean, all these kinds of beliefs. We've had a lot of conversation in our religious dialogues about propositional beliefs. These are moral beliefs that they have these that that they are attached to marriage is a function of the patriarchy i mean all of these are deeply moralistic beliefs and this has come you know now come in to become a moral system which many look upon as functionally a religious system this was driven by my you know sort of what i saw where i heard opinions and ideas that i had never heard anywhere else i mean probably the most you know contentious uh, recent example of what uh, of a luxury belief is this idea of abolishing the police. Um, to me, this is so emblematic of, you know, very comfortable, highly affluent, educated people who would never have to bear the cost of of what that policy would entail, and yet they're propounding it. They're you know they're they're, they're broadcasting it and promoting it. Uh, with the knowledge that this is going to make them look good to their peers, it's going to make them look uh, progressive and interesting and provocative and win them all these social points from their social circle uh, without really giving much thought to what would happen to the poorest among us. And yeah, well, one of there's the a things lot of that research always struck, indicating. One of the things that always struck me about beliefs in progressive, so-called progressive causes among high status individuals or those who are about to be high status individuals, which would typify everyone in an Ivy League university. I mean, if they're not high economic status at the present time, they certainly will be by all likelihood by the time they're 30 or 40. So they're already part of the upper class, regardless of their claims. They seem to want to have it both ways. They want to be members of the most privileged class and then also be rewarded for their allyship, let's say, with the oppressed. And so they get to be rich and privileged and friend to the oppressed at the same time, which always seemed to me to be a form of, uh, of greed rather than sympathy, rather than genuine sympathy. There's not much self-sacrifice involved in the adoption of the beliefs that you just described. And, what and, and again, now, if you go all the way back to my reading of Wellman, it's, it's, very, very interesting that again, in progressive liberal congregations, they are by no means as connected to actually people actually doing for other people directly as evangelical churches. I mean, all the way back to, you know, what Wellman, what Wellman saw in the churches. And, you know, the point that they're making here is devastating because functionally what has happened is a new morality has occurred, which has basically, well, if morality is all about success, well, this is about the most successful morality you can imagine. Because as, as Peterson said, I, I thought he said it very well. I don't at the same time which always seemed to me to be a form of, of, of greed rather than sympathy, rather than genuine sympathy. There's not much self-sacrifice involved in the adoption of the beliefs that you just described. And what I don't remember who said it when the upper class catches a cold, the lower class gets pneumonia. And so hmm. these destabilizing beliefs are a lot harder on people at the bottom of the socioeconomic structure than they are for people at the top who, as you said, tend to get married disproportionately often compared to people who are lower down on the socioeconomic structure. 
Now, this whole video is excellent. And, and they, I mean, it's just point after point after point after point in terms that this new morality, you know, they, they preach libertinism and they live puritanism. And, and this has been, you know, this point has been made again and again. I mean, in, you know, in, in blue state America, royalty are Barack and Michelle Obama. He's not polyamorous. And in fact, if he was always stepping out on his wife, Women wouldn't love him the way they love him now. They love him because he's faithful. And, you know, some of them would risk him being unfaithful in order to actually touch and aspire to the ideal. You know, this in contrast to, let's say, the, the governor of the state of New York. And, and in many ways, the governor of the state of New York is living the post-Christian morality, and he was brought down by it because in many ways it's incoherent. And and so these moralities actually go up and and begin to create their own religions. And again, we've seen this point made again and again and again in the anti-wokist in the anti-wokist sphere, but but now, you know, we have to ask these deep questions about okay, what is morality? Morality is a pattern of well, how do we know if it's right and wrong? How, how, how do we know this? We, we, have an, we have an internal sense. We have these moral taste buds. We're often using sort of fairness. But, but in many ways, so much of this morality, again, we can bring in Tom Holland's work, so much of this morality has changed radically in, you know, th there's, there's sort of a base level of it, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat sort of these these building blocks but the higher and higher it goes well is it is it objective is it innate H how is this known and and what what we begin to see is that it's it's deeply paired with religions and morality sort of grows up to create a religion to create the practices because remember ideals must be instantiated for us to really participate in them, whether they're a wrestler. And then once they're instantiated, we idealize the instantiation. And, and so when you look at wrestling, this is exactly what's happening. It's exactly what's happening in cinema. It's exactly what's happening in hagiography. It's exactly, and, and so you see this continuous development of morality, religion, idealization, heroes, back and forth, the knitting together of, of all of these things. And so when we watch changes in it, you know, I was, uh, Ryan Burge had a very interesting article. Uh, he, he, he tweets interesting things on Twitter and, and someone challenged him, why do, you, why do you lump black Protestants in and compare them to evangelicals and mainline? This is a, this is survey. I mean, this is a long-term survey from, looks like it starts in the early 70s and goes all the way through to the present on the question, homosexual sex is always wrong. And, well, look at how this changes. And and when I looked at this, I wondered, I wonder how vaccination rates correlate to this graph. Because a lot of it has to do with morality and a lot of it has to do with participation in you know, what the West has developed, which is the most powerful multi-billion dollar persuasion machine ever created. And it's a machine that, you know, when, when you look at, it, it's a machine that promotes affluent, high status. If you embrace this morality, you can have high status, but there's a little bit of duplicity in it in that, well, the poor who aren't actually going to Ivy League and who, like Rob Henderson, didn't grow up necessarily with all of these things, they hear, oh, life like, live like an actor, not like an Obama or not like a Biden. And and you watch this, 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 religious hierarchy moving and of course rob henderson's main point is that a little later on in the video peterson make the point that the, the affluent and the wealthy actually have 
because of their affluence, they have the buffer that they can, they can absorb the impact of a divorce and go on to live because they've got enough money. I watch what happens among the poor, and it's horrendous. And when you look at marriage rates and what's happened with out-of-wedlock childbirth over the last 30, 40, 50 years, well, how do we have our morality? Where does it come from? Who are the authorities? How does it relate to religion? Religion is clearly about communal, moral, emotional participation. And and when this multi-billion dollar persuasion machine holds up ideals and people who are instantiated in it, usually with a rather selective view, people aspire to those ideals and it actually changes their desires and they long to participate in it. Religion is clearly about communal, moral, emotional participation. And and religions break out all over the place with 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 these kinds of dynamics. It's you know, there's clearly going to be a biological structural element, but those biological structural elements are likely going to keep things in check. Now it's fascinating listening to Brett and Heather talk to Michaela Peterson and Michael Shermer about monogamy. And again, you know, I, I'm, I'm really pleased with a lot of what they're putting out there in terms of conclusions, but they're basically seeing, mora- again, their, their morality, their, their, their footnotes on morality just seem completely incoherent. So, so you're going to have the biological, but the story verse is really dominating. These ideals, the instantiation of the ideal, the hagiography of the ideal, which is usually what we see in movies, in celebrity watching, in television. That's all the hagiography of the ideals because it's all this very selective storytelling to emphasize the little morality plays that are going on around us. Now, us little folks, in the meantime, who desperately need religion because religions are these systems of of woven together moralities and ideals and hagiographies and stories and examples, people must make helpful and consequential choices because most of us don't have the kind of buffer of the affluent. And, And healthy cultures actually help those who haven't had enough time to develop the wisdom themselves make good choices. A little bit later in that video, Peterson will say, you know, in their 20s, everyone is, especially in these elite universities, they're pumped in with the idea that your career and money making is your ultimate good. And then suddenly get into your 30s and these things start to wane. Re- wisdom is, of course, helping the youth figure out how to navigate your 20s and 30s productively so you can be ready for your 50s, your 60s, and your 70s. Clear that technology and affluence and the options they afford are increasingly in play. They talk about some some really amazing sections about um, Tinder and dating apps. At scale, these things are going to greatly shape history and in many ways, a lot of misery. Uh, this has been a long, rambly video. Um, I hope that there were some nuggets in here that you could glean. I haven't put it together. But again, these videos are really thinking out loud. Elements that have sort of been weaving through my head over the last few days, including the readings of these books, trying to take these things and, and piecing together, hopefully, a coherent picture that affords wisdom to help people live. End of video. Leave a comment.